Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're very, very welcome. Uh, my name is David Donoghue, and I have the honour to chair uh, today's uh, meeting with Susanna Moorhead, who's the new head of the Development Assistance Committee at the OECD in Paris, and uh, Ida MacDonald, uh, who is a, a key uh, advisor working in the, uh, in the Development Cooperation Directorate uh, at the OECD. Um, so we're delighted to have um, Susanna uh, relatively early in her in her um, uh, tenure, and um, uh, but already uh, she is um, uh, tackling the, the major challenges of our time in relation to sustainable development and uh, uh, and the promotion of the OECD's uh, wider objectives. So I, I have a couple of housekeeping uh, points at the outset. I, I'm asked to request that you put your phones on silent and uh, we at the institution encourages tweets using the handle at IIEA. Um, the initial remarks from Susanna would be on the record. Um, uh, the question and answer session afterwards will be uh, on, on chat and house rules uh, and just in case there's anybody in the audience who hasn't heard those before, participants are free to use the information they get but not to reveal either the identity or the affiliation of the speakers or many other participants. So with that, I would like to call on Rory de Berke, the Director General of Irish Aid, where's Rory, uh, to say a few introductory remarks. Rory. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Susanna and Ida here today um, as part of this, this, this series on development matters here, here, here in the IAEA. Um, the DAC, the Development uh, Assistance Committee of the OECD, is, in our view, you know, a really, really essential cornerstone of the architecture that underpins uh, development cooperation. Um, they're kind of like the, the police, um, in a sense that you know, as a as a donor, that if you're if you're not really doing what you're told, you'll hear that, uh, and that holding to account. And that's absolutely as it should be, because in many ways, the decision to, to go to somebody else's country, to invest in making changes in their place, is one of the most political and intrusive things that we as outsiders can choose to do. And it has to be, if not regulated, it has to be orderly, it has to be ethically driven, and it has to be in a spirit of partnership and in that sort of Hobbesian world of international relations, none of those things are, are a given. And the DAC is, is, like all good police forces, our own creation, ultimately. But it's a really important tool in terms of keeping us, you know, as donors, uh, relatively honest. All the dishonesty, of course, happens with all the other parts of our balance sheet. Um, but I think that's, that's really important. And Susanna, who, who's been in the, in the role now for approximately six months or so. Less, yeah, Less, yeah, yeah, yeah. four. Well, they're very long four months. Um, you know, brings a wealth of experience to the job from her, her last role was, was as the, the, the British uh, ambassador in Ethiopia, and it was all right when she left, uh, as the line goes. Um, uh, and before that, in, in the FCO and DFID. And that, that, that political experience that having been an ambassador and having been a, a, an experienced diplomat brings is really important uh, because at the end of the day, we're talking about money and we're talking about politics. And where money and politics collide, the wisdom that a good political nose brings is really important. And it's great that she's jo joined by, by Ida, who, who is, amongst her many other skills, is actually Irish as well. So it's good to have somebody in the police force to make sure the police stay honest. Um, you know, that's really important. You're like the ombudsman um, from our perspective. Uh, and, and who, before, uh, before working for the OECD, did actually work for Irish Aid as well. So, you know, not only is she an ombudsman, she's also a fifth columnist. And we really, really appreciate your work. And Ida works on the production of the OEC Development Cooperation Report, which is, I think, a really, really important instrument um, finally, this visit it comes at a really useful time for, for Ireland because this is the year when we have our, our sort of three or, or, or four year health check, our, our DAC peer review. That process is just about beginning at the moment and uh, will really 
really kind of get into gear in, in the autumn. So having you here for these days is going to be very rich, I think, in terms of helping us prepare and to tell what I think are good stories, not just from us, us in Irish aid, but across all of the actors in Ireland who, who engage uh, with development. And it comes in the context, of course, of our new policy, A Better World, which we developed in consultation with, with most of the people in this room and beyond. It's very much a document which we don't think is is the Department of Foreign Affairs policy or even the government's policy. It isn't in many ways a people's policy, such was the, the richness of the consultation process. And at the heart of that were the SDGs, and at the heart of that was uh, leave no one behind. But within that, we actually went to the second clause of that phrase, which is furthest behind first, which I think is a really critical part of that injunction in the SDGs. And I know it's something on which uh, you know, the, the DAC have been reflecting. You know, what does leave no one behind mean? and I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. So ladies and gentlemen, jo Joanna Moorhead and Ida MacDonald. Well, Rory, thank you. Thank you very much um, for those kind words. When you said police, I was actually thinking of Sting initially. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I like the analogy, I think. Um, uh, you know, the, the DAC, I hope, as a, as a benign, transparent and accountable police force, um, but also one that, um, rather than, than simply maintaining law and order, also promotes learning um, and, 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 and best practice. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, where money and politics intersect, um, there's always scope for disagreement. Uh, for sure, um, and the DAC is a is a very broad church with a with a very wide range of views amongst its its thirty members. Um, but I have to say that um, Ireland is is a a very influential player on it. It's, it it is a um, a committee that operates by consensus. It's very definitely one person, one vote. Um, and Ireland does um, punch above its weight in many ways. I mean, not least the the um, the quality of, of your engagement, but also because I think, as, as Rory said, you, you recognise why this rather odd piece of the international development architecture matters so much, and it's because we hold each other to account as the most important um, donors. So thank you very much for this invitation. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and I, I was just saying over lunch, I, I, I keep bumping into Irish colleagues sort of all over the world, and it's, it's great. I worked extremely closely with your ambassador, Sonia Highland, in, uh, in Ethiopia. Um, and I'm particularly delighted that um, we hope uh, the, the forthcoming peer review that we'll, you will use Ethiopia as your, as your case study. Um, so we just keep our fingers crossed that we can... Um, the country will remain stable enough for you to do that, um, uh, which we're all watching very closely. Um, I read um, A Better World um, with a huge amount of interest. I was delighted. I think the DAC was name-checked four times, I counted. So I did read it very carefully, because once I'd seen it DAC, I thought I'm going to carry on. I'm not going to skim it like leave no one behind, because it's a, a very manageable document. Um, but I think it... it it's always gratifying when the launch of a new government strategy document happens at more or less the same time as, as a DAC peer review, because the point of the peer review is that it's useful to you, that you can actually take the peer review and say, OK, this, this, and this is going well. As with any review, room for improvement on this, this, and this. And it should be a living document that helps you implement that, that very challenging strategy. So what I, I, what I really want to do is to hear from you, but let me, let me just say a few words about um, my priorities. I was reminded the other day that um, when I was being um, interviewed by all 30 DAC members for this role, because you're actually elected, that I had made the commitment that I was going to spend 70% of the committee's time on what we decided were our top three priorities. Because it, you can imagine chairing something like the DAC, it's, it's a bit like trying to pin jelly to the wall. I mean, everything is relevant. and every, So you have actually really got to focus. And, and I've been very clear that we need, to, um, we need to have difficult discussions, but there is far more that, that 
unites us than divides us, and we need to build on, on consensus around where we agree. Um, and if there, is, uh, if there are areas of, of severe disagreement, which there are on some issues, then we need to find a way of knitting together that middle ground. Um, because with 30 countries, um, plus the European Union, there is bound to be a different differences of opinion. And these are political differences of opinion. They're not technical. You know, we, there's only so much that, that Ida and her colleagues in the Secretariat can resolve through, through technical means. Sometimes you've just got to have those, those tough uh, political discussions and, and come to agreement. Um, but in doing that, we have to remember what our strategic intent is, which is using this very, very precious resource that is ODA to the best way possible to achieve the sustainable development goals. And, and you know, that is work in progress because um, we don't always get it right. So what are my three priorities? The first one is um, financing development, both through ODA but also beyond ODA. And the reason for this is very clear. Um, we will be meeting in New York this summer as the international community um, to take stock of where we are with the sustainable development goals. Um, and we will learn that we are off track on most, if not all of them. And one of the main reasons for that is that um, we have not delivered on the other half of the sustainable development goals, which was the Addis Ababa action plan, which was how we were going to pay for it. Um, so that heady summer of 2015, um, which some of you will remember, when we thought, you know, we've got the goals, we've got the targets, we've figured out the financing, we put them together, and hey presto, um, by 2030 we have solved um, the scourges of, of our planet and humankind. Um, but uh, in fact, both aid and multilateralism are under, under threat. Um, I mean, if we just look at the most recent data published by um, OECD DAC, um, 2018 um, funding to sub-Saharan Africa fell by more than 4%, and for low-income countries by, by 6%. Moreover, if you look at foreign direct investment, that has dropped by about 30% to the poorest countries. So all the things that we thought would happen are, 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 are either not happening or not happening fast enough. Now, ODA is a very critical part of this, this recipe, this blend, um, but it is an increasingly small part of it. Um, I mean, ODA is about $150 billion a year. Um, at the moment, it's, it's stable. It's not going up, it's not going down. Um, some countries achieve 0.7, not Ireland yet, but I'm delighted to see that your Taoiseach has recommitted to that. Um, other countries are much, are much lower. Um, but the, the reality is that ODA on its own is never going to be enough to achieve the SDGs. So we've got to look at um, new innovative ways of crowding in both public and private finance. And there's a huge amount of work done by the Secretariat on various forms of blended finance, how you might get the private sector more involved, how we can um, make sure that all public resources are used as creatively as possible, um, and I think especially how we, we recognise, and I know this is something that is um, very much on, on Ireland's agenda, that the transition from being a very, very poor country to a lower middle income country to eventually a high income country is taking far longer than we anticipated. Inequality is rising far faster than we thought, and it's, it's very, very hard to, to get a grip on. Debt is going up. Um, so in short, the, the, um, the optimism, if you like, about how quickly we can do this is, is not coming to fruition, and we are going to need significantly more resources. So while retaining the critical role of the DAC as, as the, the custodians of the rules, the, the, the keepers of best practice, the values-based group of donors, we have also got to say we need to take this resource and see how we can use it. It's almost, I think of it as alchemy in mm -hmm. a way. How do, how do we take this odour and, and convert other things into 
useful, sustainable resources for achieving the SDGs. That's priority number one. Number two is, is what I, I call getting the balance right. Um, when we do the development cooperation report for this year, which Ida, um, I was going to say for your sins, but you probably don't have any, is going to, is going to you know, is tasked with writing this. Um, we are going to um, write a piece that describes the story. What is the case for um, development assistance in 2020? Because we think the narrative needs refreshing. And we think, we think there are a number of really quite tough um, trade-offs, and that they are in a, in a resource-constrained environment, that, that we need to think about. We don't have the answers to them, but, but they are as follows. By 2030, we know that 80% um, of the very, very poorest people in the world will live in fragile and conflict-affected states. So many donors um, have uh, taken the decision to put more and more resource in, into these states. Um, and um, Ireland is very much leading the way on that. It has, in fact, the highest share of all DAC members of bilateral funding directed to fragile countries. So well done, Ireland. But there is a but. Um, and it, it, it's, it's an open question, um, which is, are we investing too much in fragility and failure and not enough in very poor countries that are trying and that are pursuing pro-poor policies and are really trying to achieve the SDGs? And are we sending the wrong messages to those pro-poor reforming but still very poor countries if we are not rewarding them enough for good performance? I mean, I'd be really interested to hear your views on that because we don't, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but I do think it's a question that, that we need to, to ask ourselves. Um, and also, just in your, this, this very important second half of the phrase, which I, I I've told David you were responsible for, which was um, not only leaving no one behind, but putting the furthest behind first. Inevitably, the furthest behind are women and children in conflict zones. But as we know, there are an awful lot of desperately poor people for example, living in areas that are now affected negatively by climate change. So unfortunately, the, the, the furthest behind are not, I think, in the future, just going to be limited to, to fragile states. So we, we need to think about how do we target those people, but also how do we target them in ways that are going to allow them to get out of that state rather than, than just, if you like, sort of you know, providing humanitarian resources brings me to the second balance piece, which is um, have we got the balance right uh, between development, humanitarian assistance, and conflict prevention? And this one I can't, can answer, and the answer is no, we haven't. Um, the DAC uh, approved, I think it's only its sixth ever recommendation on my um, fifth day in the job, um, at the end of February, for which I can take no credit whatsoever, um, on uh, something called the um, Humanitarian Development Conflict Prevention Nexus. Not a word I particularly like, but what it means is that the committee um, has um, agreed collectively that we will hold each other and ourselves to account to improve the way that we work across that spectrum. So you'll all be familiar with it, that, that those silos between humanitarian work and development work, and I think most important of all, the lack of investment in conflict prevention. Now again, Ireland, you know, you are, uh, you're, you're making the weather on this, but many, many donors don't. Only four, two percent, sorry, of official development assistance goes to conflict prevention, and yet we know that conflict is development in reverse, mm. and we know that prevention is far better and far more um, efficient, if you like, with much better value for money than once countries have, have descended into conflict. We know this, but we don't do yeah. it. Now, part of the reason for that is it's not very easy. But, um, you know, these are the kinds of um, difficult trade-offs that we have got to, to think about. And they are trade-offs at the moment because odour is more or less stable. 
So that loops back again to then how do we get more resource in, into this whole space. And then the, the, the third element of getting the balance right is between short-term results and longer-term threats, particularly climate change. So, you know, I think you all remember when we all started delivering development results. I know this was quite contested because many of us felt we've been doing that for years anyway. It just hadn't been kind of labelled like that. But I think one of the unintended consequences of the focus on, on results um, was that we focused on things that you could achieve quite quickly and things that you could photograph. Kids in school, um, clinics, uh, vaccinated babies, etc., etc. And inevitably, um, the incentive structure within aid organisations, within um, civil society organisations, and indeed governments, um, erred towards the quick wins, the low-hanging fruit, and away from the really difficult stuff, conflict prevention, that slow, tortuous business of building those critically important institutions, and of course, climate change. So I think there is a need for us collectively to recalibrate um, and, and to um, sort of move away, if you like, from um, the simplicity and the short-termism um, and recognize the complexity that is reflected in the SDGs and, and just how long this journey is going to be. Um, I think the, 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 the sort of final big objective is, is leaving no one behind. Um, and I'm unapologetic here about, for me, this is about women and girls and gender equality. Um, I mean, there's a huge richness in this report, and I, I commend it to you. Um, and it is available online, and there is a summary at the back of the room. Um, but 52% of the world's population are discriminated against in many of the countries in which we work. Now, there is overwhelming evidence to show that if you um, invest in women and girls, you get a whole series of positive developmental outcomes, and that societies where gender equality is relatively good are also better about how disabled people are treated, about how ethnic minorities are treated, about um, how LGBT people are treated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you start with the 52%, you build a virtuous circle. Um, and we have been talking about this for more years than I care to remember, and I'm, I'm ashamed, and I, I said this at the senior level meeting, that only 4% of official development assistance is principally targeted on gender. It's 4%. I mean, it's pathetic, really. Um, Ireland, I have to say, is... is uh, doing much better than that. Um, but uh, there is still a very, very long way to go. So 86% of your Irish bilateral aid um, included a gender equality marker. So that compares to about 63% um, of bilateral aid um, overall. Um, but you were 15% where it was a principal marker as opposed to the, the DAC average of four. So, I mean, you really, you know, you are um, sending a very, very clear signal there, and I want you to shout that from the rooftops, and particularly to shout about what the, the positive externalities of that investment are. So if you do that, what else follows that is good? And I think we, you know, we do have a lot of evidence, but, but we need to be far more uh, vocal about it. And let me just finish by saying, as I'm, as I'm um, speaking here at IIEA, um, and that you are an international affairs think tank as well, well as development, um, I think it would be remiss not to touch on the foreign policy and development cooperation piece. I mean, Rory mentioned the fact that, you know, I'm, I mean, I have a development background, but I've also served as an ambassador. I have a foreign policy background as well. Um, and it seems to me that, that just as it will be impossible to talk about uh, development and climate change separately in the next five to 10 years, I think it's increasingly um, unhelpful to try and talk about development without the foreign policy or the diplomacy dimension. Now that's partly to do because conflict is, is playing such a big role, but also for a variety of other reasons. I mean, we know, for example, that 
China is investing massively in Africa. I mean, that is as much a foreign policy question as it is a development or a, 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 um, a, a debt question. Um, we know that uh, the post-Second World War international system is, is, I think, being questioned and challenged in ways at the moment from many, many quarters, in ways certainly that I haven't seen in my lifetime, and that that will have an impact on our collective commitment to the SDGs and many other things. So unless we sort of put the, the politics back into development assistance... I fear that, that we are going to struggle to achieve what we're trying to do. And let me be clear, that is not to say that we should um, weaponize aid. Um, it's not to say that uh, we move away from the principles and values that the DAC holds so dear, which is that the principal intent of development assistance is poverty reduction and achieving the SDGs. But it is just to say that in... 2019, the real politique dictates that we take into account the foreign policy dimension of our interventions, because I fear um, if we don't, we will not be a seat at the right table. Um, so let me stop there. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very, very happy to take any questions. It's not a word. Delighted to have you, and thank you for a very rich presentation, quite uh, challenging. And uh, there were, there, there, there were there is much to provoke and to, to think about in what you've said. Um, Ida will now present very briefly on the uh, Joining Forces to Leave No One Behind report. You'll see a copy of it there. And Ida, in fact, was centrally involved in the production of it. And then we will, uh, we will have, a, I hope, about 20, 25 minutes for, for questions. Okay, Ida. Thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here, to be here at home um, and uh, to tell you a little bit about the work that I do but with an awful lot of people uh, in, in the OECD. Um, so I don't want to take too much time because it would really be great to hear from you, uh, maybe hear some of your questions and certainly responses to Susanna because this is a great opportunity to, to see how we can move forward some important issues in the DAC. So we did a massive report and, and I'm going to tell you actually in a moment why we did it. it's such a big report because uh, there's, a, there's, there's a good reading, it links with the subject which is uh, leaving no one behind. And I just want to give you a sense of the scope of this report, assuming that the slide moves down. But to give you a sense, it's, it's a large chapter because when we were asked to, to focus on what Leave No One Behind means and to drill down a little bit beyond the slogan of Leaving No One Behind that's in the preamble of the 2030 Agenda, we thought, well, this is going to be a, a risky job because... Oh, thank you. Thanks, Kira. <laughs> um, because when we started consulting with people, we heard that it meant something very different <laughs> to everybody, and it depended on which interest group and what their particular interest was in development cooperation. So there were various dimensions of it that it was a priority, and that if we focused too narrowly uh, on what leave no one behind would mean, that we would really be skewing the discussion. And really what our objective here was is to start a discussion, to start a debate about what leaving no one behind would mean in the practice of development cooperation. Um, translating policies and commitments into practice is, is extremely challenging. So really, in terms, this is our table of contents, and uh, you can look at it for those of you who aren't on the right side, but I, <laughs> you can uh, also look at it in the highlights. And we look at why it matters, um, what it means to be left behind, and here we've got lots of different perspectives from, from poverty experts, inequality, fragile, uh, fragility, governance, disability, and here, we, through looking at those dimensions, we actually saw also what were the cross-cutting dimensions of leaving no one behind and the intersecting, reinforcing elements that then gets us to talk about the root causes and the drivers of what actually has people being excluded or marginalised. Um, then we look at some policies and practices that work and the role of key actors. We look at civil society, the private sector, but actually micro and small, medium-sized enterprises in developing countries rather than the big global multinational corporations and, and their role in, in promoting development. And then we drill down, obviously, on our core business, which is development cooperation. Um, and so uh, there we, we look at the policies, the financing um, and the programming. Um, we have over 43 case studies uh, contributed in a special, a separate document that looks at lessons learning. Um, and I have to say that I'm just speaking in parts the, on behalf of all the 
almost, well, not on behalf of all of them, but 250 co contributors to this report. So I, I coordinated the report, I helped edit the report, but I didn't do it. All those people who contributed to it um, made, the, made the report. So just a few words on uh, why, leave no one be why we chose uh, leaving no one behind. Um, David can say an awful lot more about where leaving no one behind came from in the 2030 agenda, but really we see leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest behind first as something radically different. Um, and is potentially transformative. Um, but because it's radically different and potentially transformative, it's extremely challenging as to how you put it into practice because it implies a lot of reform and it re implies really thinking through um, th those reforms and resistance, uh, resistance to change. The bottom line is, is that the SDGs cannot be achieved if people are left behind. Um, and so really we've set ourselves up for an extremely ambitious agenda. And it's a commitment that's universal. It applies to Irish uh, citizens as much as it applies to, to people in, 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 in other countries. In the committee, we saw a major risk that this is going to become a slogan. It sounds great. And we're going to do this in the spirit of leaving no one behind. But there's no accountability behind it um, and very little guidance around it. So we wanted to also open that, that Pandora's box. Um, so ultimately, we see it as accelerating progress for the furthest behind, um, but also lifting the boat for everybody, for everyone. So there, there, and this comes back to, to attention that I'll, I'll speak to a moment. And a positive slant we put on this is really about being inclusive, equitable, and sustainable across the policies um, that we uh, pursue and our programming and our, and our partnerships. Um, now on to the next. Um, why it matters now and why it matters now more than ever. So these charts are just give you a glimpse. We have reached a point in time where we have had phenomenal global development progress. So that, that is great. And the World Bank told us earlier at the end of last year we were below the 10% mark on uh, extreme poverty. Um, we have had great, great, great progress on vaccinations. All you need to do is read Hans Rosling or <laughs> look at the charts in our world and data. And there is a very good narrative there around progress. Um, but the problem is, is that that progress has left an awful lot of people behind still. We have the 730 million people living on less than $1.90. But we also hear Martin Revalian uh, talking about the fact that there is actually a very stable number of people that even in the MDG period have not shifted at all in terms of the intensity of their poverty and that they really are the poorest of the poor and nothing is improving, uh, nothing is improving for them. So um, here I think it's important to... to contextualize uh, uh, leaving no one behind in global development progress. And now looking more closely at those who are um, left behind. Um, we can have the, have the next slide. And we zoom down a little bit on SDG 1 and SDG 10, because extreme poverty is getting to zero on extreme poverty, and then SDG 10 on, on inequality. And we see these as two major issues that emerge in, in from, the, from the report uh, that really matter. Um, and so if we look at this, we are actually off track now um, and for 2030 on SDG 1. So, and wh where we're going, and this refers to what uh, Susanna mentioned, is, is that where we're, the, the kind of, um, Homie Harris talks about it, the pathways out of poverty, we cannot rely on the strategies of the MDG period because we know it was China and India and Bangladesh and India, Indonesia. That these are in severely off track countries which require a very different kind of engagement. Um, than before. This is where governance is weak, institutions are weak, we need to look at peace and security. And here, investing in pure economic growth is not going to be um, the way out in terms of uh, including people. So that's on, on poverty. And then we also have this challenge around uh, inequality. Um, and this is a, an issue that the OECD, even the IMF, <laughs> is increasingly talking about because we realize that rising inequalities, both in income and wealth, but also in rights-based um, globally and within countries, is a break on growth. It's a break on sustainable development. It's going to be a bottleneck. So we have to target uh, inequalities. Um, and so this is where we're talking about shifting to an inclusive growth agenda. We're talking about getting beyond <coughs> GMP as our measure of economic success to talk about well-being, looking at redistribution policies, um, looking at wages and decent work, and ultimately becoming um, people-centered. So then talking about people, and this is also quite evident in, in our, 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 our Ireland's policy, here I think there's an important point to be made about, obviously, if people, specific people and groups are left behind. Um, and there is, a, in development cooperation, an effort to target those groups. Um, but there's a debate around this as to how we remove the barriers to their 
inclusion and their cross-cutting issues. And this is where we need to start looking at how we make all the policies inclusive and more inclusive and equitable and have targeted and corrected measures when you need to, but they're a short-term solution because they're not going to get to the drivers and the root causes of, uh, of, of being left behind. And of course, in that context, data systems are really important in getting better data. So onto the DAC and the Development Corporation and a few words about Ireland, and I'll, I'll go quickly. So the good news is, and we surveyed the members, the good news is that actually across the DAC, most are very favourable and interested in principle of leaving no one behind. They're attaching it to their policies, um, and, and, they, and they, they really like to talk about it. So there's a lot of interest, but there is not a lot of capacity. Um, and this, uh, these few points here speak to some quite political oper and operational challenges, as well as the financing challenging, because we're actually not coming up with the financing. We're failing on ADIS. Um, and the political challenges are, are those that Susanna spoke to. I'm not going to, to get into them in, in more detail. But there's also this issue of um, if you want to get the root causes of exclusion uh, globally, then we have to also look at the global rules-based system and, how, and the reform that's needed uh, multilaterally and in the international system. Um, and here it comes back also to issues like tax uh, and, and so on. Um, and so I'll move then on to uh, our, our uh, call for reform, is, is that uh, we think that really, if you're really serious about leaving no one behind and translating it into practice, we actually need to really rethink the framework for development cooperation. And that our narratives, and I think it comes out quite nicely in Better World, our narratives need to link how the, natural, the, the national interest with the mutual benefit idea that by actually investing in people and in having more inclusive development, everybody benefits and is prosperous for everybody else. In the programming, it's a really challenge that in the sense that we have to get beyond vertical programs that target specific groups, and we have to see how the whole portfolio thinks through inclusiveness, thinks through in equity, and thinks through the, the effect even and the impact of those uh, programs on the furthest behind and those who are left behind. And then on ODA, I think it's a very important point in terms of uh, that we have to, to leverage and get more, or get more financing, but it's actually tracking those flows. And we had some, a very good, nice box in the report where a researcher has found that ODA going to the poorest countries, but it gets to the richest areas in the poorest countries. How are we dealing with that? We're not even tracking the resources below the national level. So on Ireland, um, and I, I'll just show a couple of, of points, um, some, some questions looking uh, at, uh, at, your, at your new programme, our new policy. Ireland has been a champion for poverty reduction. For, for, for years, um, and is well known for that. And we see gender equality, humanitarian need, climate change, governance as clear, clear priorities. But it's really interesting to, to hear from you and to discuss where poverty fits into that and how your approach is to, to, to extreme poverty um, globally, but also uh, in, in the country level. And we see your, your motivations are, are around mutual benefit. Um, the financing, you have a very, had a strong focus on countries most in need and progress for, for the most vulnerable. And there is an issue around partnering and how you partner with agents of change. And I'm going to skip, actually. Well, just slip to the second, next, not the slide, not the next slide, but the next one, Kira, where we look at Ireland's support for civil society. Um, because here we can actually see that a very, almost 40% of the bilateral program is channeled to and through civil society organizations. So they're a major partner for the delivery um, of Ireland's development cooperation. And I'd really be interested to, you know, the, we say in the report, and it's a very good chapter six on civil society as agents of change, but really protecting and nurturing the civil society that's closest to the marginalized, most marginalized people. And how are we connecting with those, with that civil society? And there's a reform agenda to be, to be um, pursued there. And so um, I'll leave it at that. There's a well, I can share the slides. There's some other slides on your focus on LDCs, which actually appears to be declining um, in where Ireland has historically been uh, one of the better performance on least developed countries. How does that uh, meet with the, the leaving no one behind commitment? Um, and a very positive chart on uh, your support for gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, and there's a couple of questions that I threw out there at the end, if you'd like to uh, show them, Kira. Um, but I'll leave it, with, leave it at that, and please feel free to follow up with us uh, if you want to have more questions. Thank you.